O Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. I'm sorry if uh, the gospel reading wasn't very loud. I forgot to turn my little headset on, but I, I hope you heard it. It was, it was a good gospel and kind of central to what I'm about to preach on. <laughs> it's been an eventful week. We've seen the results of a, a vigilant effort to turn out voters in various primaries and to ensure that the state of Kansas retained the rights of reproductive choice in their constitution. Quite a surprise. We also saw the irony of a failure of vigilance by Alex Jones, the infamous InfoWars charlatan, the successful lawsuit by the parents of the Sandy Hook massacre victims who have been relentlessly harassed by Jones and his trolls is now costing him over 49 million dollars. It was one of the most satisfying moments in this past week for me, only to be outdone by the lack of vigilance by Mr. Jones's lawyers who inadvertently sent the prosecution all his cell phone data, proving his extensive perjury and bad faith and opening up the phone's contents to be subpoenaed by the January 6th uh, in, uh, Inquiry Committee and the Department of Justice. I've always said God is irony. Since Mr. Jones was involved up to his eyeballs in promoting the events of that day, I, I guess I can say my schadenfreude is not completely unseemly. Given all of the horrors of this past year, I was getting to the point where I was afraid I would really struggle to find the good news to preach in our current environment. So, vigilance. The word of the day, vigilance. What are we vigilant about? What does it say, and what does that say about who we are and what we value? We can be vigilant about all sorts of things. We, many try to be vigilant about their jobs and their family responsibilities, or at least certain aspects of them. Some people are vigilant about their diets, not me, and their health routines. Others are practicing vigilant uh, musical instruments, sports, dance. Some are vigilant in their relationships, supporting friends and loved ones. And some, I hear, are even vigilant about their spiritual practices. Isn't that interesting? I could learn a few things from that. Vigilance can be wonderful. It helps us maintain focus, become more skilled and productive. But vigilance itself, you know, as a value or a characteristic, is morally neutral. Because one can be just as vigilant and meticulous about planning or covering up crimes or manipulating language to telegraph morally repugnant views while maintaining plausible deniability. Well, like Mr. Jones and any number of others in his circle. We have entire industries that are devoted to carefully monitoring and manipulating attention and thought for the sake of consolidating power. But some people are obsessively vigilant uh, protectors of their own egos, you know, keeping track of perceived enemies and avenging personal slights, not missing an opportunity to strike back at those who challenge or contradict or undermine their presumed status. Nobody comes to mind at the moment, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you can find plenty of examples. Others are vigilant in protecting their power bases and ideologies, 
vigilant about creating loopholes in legislation or stacking the courts with judicial ideologues or government agencies with compliance sycophants. Like everything else, vigilance can be used for good or evil. We can have a love orientation or it can have a, a fear orientation. And in today's scriptures, Isaiah and Jesus speak not only about our, our personal, political, and, and spiritual vigilance, but God's. Their rhetoric was, exposed, uh, was exposing to the Jewish nation and, and the followers of Jesus a corrective to the false and destructive values that were at the root of why and how so many good religious folk were exercising their vigilance in destructive ways. From the opening verses, Isaiah's articulation of God's fed upness, right, is palpable. What to me are, is the multitude of your sacrifices? I've had enough. Trample my courts no more. I can't endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your festivals my soul hates. Your hands are full of blood. Pretty harsh. The religious and political leadership of 8th century Judaism uh, uh, was a mess. Or, I mean, the 8th, uh, yeah, 8th, uh, uh, the leadership of the 8th uh, decade in, in the 1st century of Judaism was a mess. Not unlike today. All kinds of betrayals and iniquities were unfolding. Civil war between rival Jewish kingdoms, increased concentration of wealth, the continual abuse and marginalization of the poor, the widowed, the orphaned. So God had Isaiah send this warning, condemning mere piety, that religious vigilance, to those who ignored the spiritual building blocks of justice, grace, and compassion. Their religious practices were worthless because they weren't rooted in how God called them to serve the world, but rather in what they hoped to gain from the world. In Luke's Gospel today, we're given examples of how our vigilance can be properly aligned with God's. In, instead of religious vigilance or piety, let's say he was more focused on spiritual vigilance or perhaps mimetic vigilance, since it's rooted in mimicking the behavior of our Lord and Savior. And the first point that he drives home is that our gospel reinforces that Christian vigilance has nothing to do with fear. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. When fear takes over, we don't just have vigilance, but rather what psychologists refer to as hypervigilance. Hypervigilance occurs when someone's gripped by some sort of trauma. It is by its nature limiting and not expansive. Right? Its function is to help you through this intense period of perceived danger. But if it takes over, and all the automatic life-saving responses that can then be triggered by non-threatening events to such a degree that that we can't function effectively or healthfully in what we should perceive as a normal society. And hypervigilance is not just the result of, of things as dramatic as you know, mass shootings, gunfire, or explosions. We've also seen it throughout the course of this pandemic. Even the church and other institutions have been purveyors of traumas that have elicited hypervigilant responses in people. 
And I'm not just talking about the political and clerical abuse scandals that have touched every religious institution, but also the spiritual violence that has beaten down individuals over time because of their perceived sins or otherness. The church has too often become an icon of fear and not an icon of love. And people have been alienated from her embrace because of that iconography. So God's saying, let's, yes, be vigilant, but let's be vigilant in the right ways. Let's get back on track. When properly focused, our spiritual vigilance can be a tool for long-term success. But that success is not necessarily rooted in what the world would have us believe. Because the world relies on fear to further its definition of success. And Jesus says to his disciples, do not be afraid, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Give you the kingdom. Not earn the kingdom. Right? And what is the kingdom? Is it magical thinking that gives you millions as a reward for faithfulness or theological obedience? Say a certain prayer enough times, things magically appear for you? Is it a celestial Disneyland for the right people? No. As Jesus shows us, the kingdom is our world with relationships set right, both with God and each other and all of God's creation. And God is vigilant about reminding us that we should be focusing our attention on that truth. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. True treasure is rooted in our hearts. If your treasure is rooted in scarcity, either now or, or for the afterlife, then your heart's rooted in fear, not love. And God's not keeping us afraid to enforce obedience. We keep each other afraid in order to enforce our will upon each other. But God wants us to thrive. And we can, so long as we don't become obsessed with possessing things as a substitute for living in relationships of love, which was the central thesis of our gospel reflections, both last week and this week, which is a continuation. This week, Luke just continues to fill in the de details. Theologian Richard Steele writes, people who are fixated on how much they have tend to be inattentive to who they are. Yeah, I mean, for example, consider the complete lack of self-awareness uh, in people such as Alex Jones and many of his fellow travelers. In contrast, those who concern themselves with who they are before God tend to be generous and responsible with what they have. They understand wealth to be a trust from God, the proper disposition of which reflects well, not only their allegiance to God, but also their awareness how their conduct in the here and now affects their destinies. And Jesus shares another truth about the nature of vigilance in the allegory of the slaves who are prepared for their master's Im imminent return. They're dressed, their lamps are lit, they're anticipating that knock, and they're ready to say, yes, welcome home, come on in even though they don't know what that moment will, when that moment will be, they live in such a way that it assumes it's possible at any moment. It's an orient orientation of possibility, not scarcity. It doesn't say they're afraid what will happen if the master doesn't return. We're told that when the master returns and finds them ready, 
He's going to invite him to sit down and we're going to have dinner. We're going to have a party. Right? And when we live that way, we can actually create moments where Christ does come again. Where the Master is actually among us and feeding us and leading us. We make those second comings happen in the here and now. And vigilance, therefore, is rooted in, the poss in this possibility, is generative, is life-giving. And that's the way we experience blessing, right? And isn't that what Jesus' aud Jesus's audiences have struggled with for the, for the past 2,000 years? Luke's community had been waiting to experience the second coming for decades. And many throughout the Christian world have, have waited and planned and complained and fretted about it ever since. But Christians who marry their vigilance with an attitude of positive expectation break into God's kingdom, or, or better yet, allow God's kingdom to break into their presence over and over throughout history. It's what we call the communion of saints. You know, they've witnessed to us in every age that Christ's coming again is a present reality and we can just tap into it when we are vigilant in our divine expectations. And then Jesus offers us one last piece of wisdom. But know this, Jesus says, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is, is coming at an unexpected hour. We have all kinds of things lurking, not simply outside our doors, but inside our minds. And they seek to steal not just our material wealth, but also our mental and spiritual welfare. And while we mustn't become paralyzed by that possibility, we, we must be on guard against fooling ourselves that we have it all together, both materially and spiritually. In other words, we, we must remain vigilant in our humility. We know that the foolish farmer last week thought that building bigger and better barns for his excess would secure his needs when death could take it all in the flash. But we have another possibility. So let's be vigilant. Let's hold tenaciously on to the relationships that we have been rooted in as a people. A relationship to our community, to our God, the one given to us in baptism and exercised each week as we come together to share the word and sacraments of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's this relationship that equips us for rich, rich life because through us, Christ is vigilant about working his healing power. That's how our master surprises us with his presence. So, let's be ready.